Hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to the Ensemble 95 release webinar. My name is Ben, I'm one of the outreach officers uh, that works in the Ensemble team uh, and just in this short webinar I want to show you about the new uh, data and the updates that we've made uh, within Ensemble uh, in the latest release that we just released last week. So before we begin I just want to start by introducing you to the webinar interface. Um, so you should have uh, my, sheet, my screen shared with you. Uh, you should also be able to see a webcam uh, and hear my voice as well. Um, you should also have a, a, a toolbar that allows you to interact with the webinar um, that has lots of different options for you to see. Uh, one of the options that you can use uh, is the chat option. So uh, in that box, in that section, you're allowed to ask questions. Um, and I do have a colleague, Astrid, uh, and she'll hopefully try and answer some of the questions that you have uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, if you have any questions that are left at the end of the webinar, uh, then I'm going to quickly see if there's any unanswered questions at the end, uh, and we can go through those as well. So just to give you a bit of background to the Ensemble project before I start talking to you about the, the new data that we've incorporated, um, Ensemble is a genome browser. It's one of many that are available. Um, and we need genome browsers for a very, very important reason. And it's because we have lots and lots of genome sequences for lots of different species available uh, these days. So the first organism to have its genome sequenced was a bacteriophage uh, back in 1977 by Fred Sanger and his team uh, here in the UK. Uh, but it was only five kilobases in size. So by today's standards, uh, that is obviously a very small genome. Uh, but that technology laid the foundations for more and more complex organisms to have their genome sequenced uh, until uh, in the early 2000s, uh, the first draft, the first publication of the first draft of the human genome sequence was published. Uh, and that was three gigabases in size. So obviously you can see just in those few decades uh, how uh, the increase uh, in the technological uh, ability led to the uh, sequencing of, of much larger uh, genomes. Even since then, we have uh, the advent of next generation sequencing technologies, which has led to the, um, the conception and the birth of lots of different uh, projects that's aimed at sequencing, firstly, lots of different species on the planet, uh, but also lots of different individuals uh, within different populations uh, as well around the world as well. So all of these sequencing efforts uh, leads us to the accumulation of a large amount of raw sequence data. Uh, and obviously this doesn't mean an awful lot to anybody, uh, but buried within that sequence uh, is lots of important information that's in interesting for, for scientists who are, who are studying uh, genes and genomes. So obviously buried within the sequence, we have uh, genes themselves. Um, we also have features that regulate gene expression like promoters and enhancers. You could even find positions that differ between individuals that might be linked with phenotype and diseases as well. So that's what Ensemble tries to do. It tries to take these genome sequences, annotate them with, with data, with information, uh, and then make it available uh, for scientists to use uh, in, in their work. So to do this, Ensemble has four main types of data. So just to quickly um, look over those, we have firstly the genomic assemblies with the automated gene annotation. We also have the variation data, so that's both small and large scale sequence variants with phenotype associations where they're uh, available as well. The third type of data is the comparative genomics. So these include things like whole genome alignments uh, and ortholog predictions and gene trees. The fourth type of data is the regulation data. So this is the, uh, the newest type of data we have uh, that's only available for human and mouse at the moment, but this is where we predict the existence of features that regulate gene expression, such as promoters and enhancers using uh, a wealth of biological uh, data, such as ChIP-seq data uh, and DNA methylation data. So to draw these four branches of data together, Ensemble has a number of features. So firstly, as I've mentioned, we have our gene builds for over 100 species uh, in Ensemble now. Uh, and then we also take those gene builds side by side to produce our gene trees, uh, which is one of the um, comparative analyses that we perform. As I've explained, we also have the regulatory build uh, and the display of variation data as well. You can also do some other quite neat things with Ensemble as well. So firstly, you can display your own data in Ensemble. 
Uh, and you can also begin thinking about exporting data uh, in, in more advanced ways as well. So outside of the genome browser, we also have Biomart, which is a data export tool. Uh, and you can also access the data programmatically using our Perl and our REST APIs. The best thing about all of this is that it's completely open source. So all of the data we have in, in Ensemble is completely free for you to take and use uh, and analyze and publish within your work as well. So as I've mentioned, we have over 100 uh, genome, genomes in Ensemble now, uh, and the Ensemble project is dedicated to vertebrate genomes. So we try and cover the broadest taxon taxonomic space possible, uh, including obviously human, the other great apes, uh, as well as a large number of other primates, um, rodents, uh, and other placental mammals that obviously have conservation, uh, evolutionarily um, or medically, uh, agriculturally important um, features to them as well. We also have marsupials and monotremes, as well as a large number of other birds, reptiles, fish, and amphibians as well. One of the important things to remember um, when using Ensemble and working with biological data is that it's not static. So all the time, new, new experiments are being published and generating uh, new data. So Ensemble tries to keep up with this uh, generation of data by having, release, uh, having periodic releases. So every two to three months, uh, Ensemble performs all of the analyses and packages that all up and releases it as a version of Ensemble. So uh, in October of 2018, for example, we had Ensemble 94. Now that was the current release up until just a few days ago. So obviously at the end of 2018 and the beginning of 2019, we were looking for new genome assemblies that had been published. Uh, we updated our underlying software. We updated our gene sets and re-performed our analyses and updated our interfaces. And then we packaged that all up and we released it as Ensemble 95, which is why we're here today. So we want to think about all of the new things that we're including in Ensemble 95, uh, which was obviously just released last week. So in Ensemble 95, I have a few highlights just to introduce you to the new data we have, and we're gonna think about some of these in more detail uh, later on in the webinar. So firstly, for human, we have a new regulatory build for both GRC H38 and GRC H37. They're the two uh, versions of the human genome assembly that we actively support. Uh, we also have an update to the gene set for mouse, bringing us to gen code M20. We also have a large number of other vertebrate species that have been added for the first time in Ensemble. So we also have um, donkey, polar bear, American black bear, red fox, koala, dingo, tuatara, painted turtle, and Aegis desert tortoise as well. Uh, we also, as well as having new species, we also updated the genome assembly that's available for three other important agricultural species as well which is cow, chicken, and horse. Finally, we also have a new protein structure viewer, which is what I want to show you uh, at the very end of the webinar today. Uh, but we also have updated variation data for human GRC H37. Uh, and we also have updates uh, to our non-vertebrate project as well. So uh, Ensemble Genomes, www.ensemblegenomes.org, uh, is our sister project that has information and data relating to non-vertebrate species. Uh, and they've also released an update last week as well. Uh, and there are new plant and metazoa species available uh, through EnsembleGenomes.org as well. So one of the main headlines that we have for the release is the new regulatory build. So within Ensemble, we use a variety of different uh, pieces of experimental and biological data uh, to predict where features that regulate gene expression exist. So all along the genome, we use experimental evidence to predict where promoters, enhancers, repressors exist. So we had that um, in Ensemble 94 and for the previous releases as well. But the new uh, Ensemble 95 is a new regulatory build which incorporates the most up-to-date data from the ENCODE portal. So ENCODE is a separate project that's aimed at, at generating lots of um, experimental data that from ChIP-seq experiments, from bisulfite sequencing experiments, uh, from DNA methylation experiments, 
looking at these patterns uh, of, of epigenetics uh, and histone modification, transcription factor binding, uh, all along uh, the genome. So Ensemble incorporates data from the ENCO project in their annotation of these promoters and enhancers, uh, as well as other projects as well, such as the Roadmap Epigenomics project, uh, and also uh, the Blueprint project as well. So in the new Ensemble 95 release, we have 55 new epigenomes, so 55 new different cell types, uh, and also updated data for 38 different cell types as well. So in the previous release, we had 68 different cell types, uh, and then obviously we added 55 new, bringing us to 123 different cell types represented uh, in the new Ensemble regulatory build. Uh, and that's obviously increased the number of regulatory features that we've annotated uh, and also increased the coverage of the genome. So we've gone from 341,929 uh, regulatory features annotated before, split into a number of different categories such as CTCF binding sites, enhancers, promoter flanking regions, promoters, transcription factor binding sites and open chromatin features as well. Uh, and that number's now gone up to 675,965 regulatory features in total. As I mentioned, there's also a number of other species uh, that we've added to the latest ensemble release. So there's nine new species in total, uh, which were the polar bear, the dingo, the tuatara, uh, the donkey, the red fox, the American black bear, uh, as well as the koala and the painted turtle uh, and Agizis desert tortoise as well. So you can access all of the data for these nine species through Ensemble, just as you would for any other species that you're studying. Uh, and we have the genome sequence, uh, the gene annotation, uh, as well as the comparative analyses as well. As I mentioned, we also updated the genome assemblies that we have for three important agricultural species as well. So we updated the cow genome assembly uh, from UMD 3.1, that was the older version of the, uh, of the cow genome assembly, to the ARS UCD 1.2 version. Uh, that was actually published in April uh, of last year. So we've just finished uh, the annotation uh, of the cow uh, updated genome assembly and have included that in Ensemble 95. We've also included uh, the update to the horse genome assembly going from um, EQCAB 2 to EQCAB 3.0. Uh, and we've also updated the chicken genome assembly as well. So we've gone from Gallus Gallus 5.0 to the GRC uh, G6A version. So this is a, the new version of the chicken genome assembly that's been published by the Genome Reference Consortium uh, again in April last year. So to perform the gene annotation for these species, um, we've used a combination of protein to genome alignments, uh, also annotation mapping, uh, from a suitable reference species uh, and also RNA-seq data alignments as well. The penultimate thing I want to talk to you about uh, is the updated variation data that we have uh, for human. So in Ensemble uh, 94, we updated the human GRCH38 variation database uh, to include variants from dbSNP151, which is a version uh, of the dbSNP variation database, uh, but these variants have now been mapped to GRCH37, so that's the older version of the human genome assembly, but which is still widely used. So we've mapped all of the variants from dbSNP151 uh, and to, to the GRCH37 build, uh, and you can now access the data for those through the GRCH37 archive. So you can also get the allele frequency data from the NOMAD project and TopMed as well for these variants as well. The final thing that I want to talk to you about uh, is the Protein Structure Viewer. So this is a new uh, feature, a new tool that we've been working on uh, to add to Ensemble, uh, and it comes from our, our colleagues uh, in PDBE. So basically what we've done is we've included a light mole widget uh, to visualize uh, the protein structure data uh, for the transcripts that you might be interested in studying. So at the moment, we have these structures available for more than 3,700 different ensemble transcripts. Uh, so you can basically select different PDBE protein structures to view uh, and manipulate the view 
uh, to show protein domains from PFAM or Gene3D, as well as variants uh, colored by the SIFT and Polyfen scores as well. So to access the data uh, in this way, you can click on the 3D protein model, which is a link in the left-hand side in the menu of the transcript tab. So I'm going to show you how to do that in a moment. But using the protein structure viewer, you can also visualize the effect of individual variants on the protein structure. So what you need to do is navigate to a variant of interest, perhaps using a variant ID, uh, and then click on the 3D protein model link in the menu on the left-hand side of the variant tab. So there's two screenshots that you can see at the bottom. Uh, firstly, on the left uh, is the view of a missense variant. So this is an individual amino acid residue that is affected uh, and that will be highlighted, allowing you to visualize its location within the protein structure. And on the right, you can see uh, a stop gain variant, for example. So you can see the section of the protein which is still encoded before the stop gain variant uh, obviously deletes the rest of the protein which is in colored in red. So what I want to do now is just quickly come out of my presentation and I'm going to navigate to the Ensemble browser and show you how to access the protein structure viewer and the variation structure viewer as well. So if you go to uh, www.ensemble.org, you'll find the Ensemble homepage. Uh, you can see obviously over on the right hand side, you can see the current release number. This is Ensemble release 95. Uh, and what, I want, what we want to do is just quickly look for a, a single uh, transcript and find its structure. So using the search box, I'm going to search for RNH1, which is a gene of interest for me. And then I'm going to search. And I'm going to navigate to the gene tab from the, from the search results. And then I need to pick on a single transcript. So I'm going to show the transcript table. And from that table, I'm going to click on the stable ID for the RNH1201 transcript. And I'm going to hide the transcript table again, as we're now in the transcript tab. Over on the left hand side, you can see a menu. And within that menu, there's a section, a link that says 3D protein model. So if you click on that now, you can now see the light mole widget with the structure of the protein that's encoded by the transcript of interest. So underneath the image itself that you can manipulate by clicking and dragging your mouse, you can see a number of different options and features at the bottom as well. So you can do things like highlighting the exons. So if you want to highlight the, the section of the protein that's encoded by individual exons, you can click on the eye icon to turn that on. So when you look at the structure now, you can see that each section of the protein is color coordinated according to the exon that encodes it. And then we can turn that off again. You can also turn on, for example, uh, the PFAM protein information. So you, now when you look up, you can see the different motifs and domains that are encoded uh, by uh, by you can see the, that are encoded in the protein uh, as, a, as annotated by PFAM. Uh, and you can also annotate the variants onto the view. So you can add the SIFT variants. So you can add variants that are color coordinated according to their SIFT score. And you can also do the same to show variants annotated and color coordinated according to their polyfen score. So what you can do is you can use the light mole widget in exactly the same way as you would in PDBE, for example. So you can click on specific residues to um, focus in on an area of interest. You can click and drag to move the protein structure relative to your screen. And you can also move in and out. You can scroll and zoom using the right click and moving your mouse as well. So the other thing that I wanted to show you was the variation structure viewer. So we can do that again just by navigating back to the home page and then searching for a variant ID. So I'm going to search for RS143649. And then clicking go. 
that takes me to uh, the search results for this variant. So I can click on the link to navigate to the variant tab. So now we're in the variant tab, you can see in the blue bar at the top and in the menu on the left hand side, uh, there's a link that's called 3D protein model. So again, you can click here. So you can see we're looking at a missense variant. So this is obviously a variant that changes the amino acid that's encoded at a particular position uh, within the protein. Uh, so now you can see when you click and drag and move the image using your mouse, you can see the highlighted residue here. So this is our residue in the protein that's been changed uh, by the variant. And again, you can click here uh, and zoom in on your variant of interest. You can obviously see if it's part of a helix or part of a beta sheet or in a, a helix turn helix loop motif or you can basically see perhaps how the variant will be affecting the protein structure and function. OK, so that brings me to the end uh, of the webinar. Just to finish up, I just want to um, give you a few further links to learn about Ensemble. So firstly, I want to tell you about the Ensemble workshops that we host. So we can teach Ensemble workshops at your institute for free, uh, except for the training expenses. So if you're interested in hosting either a browser workshop or a REST API course, for example, you can email helpdesk at ensemble.org to try and organize for one of the trainers to come and deliver a workshop at your institute. And you can also uh, go online to find further help and documentation uh, about Ensemble as well. So firstly, they have, we have lots of online courses that have been made available through the EBI. So if you go to www.ebi.ac.uk, you can find lots of online training courses for all of the services at the EBI, but also including Ensemble. We also have a YouTube channel um, so you can go to YouTube and type in Ensemble Training to navigate to the Ensemble YouTube channel, uh, where we've got lots of recorded uh, tutorials and demonstrations, uh, as well as webinars as well. So this webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the Ensemble YouTube channel. And if you have any questions about using Ensemble as well, you can email helpdesk at ensemble.org um, with any questions that you have about the data um, in Ensemble, or perhaps if you can't find something or if you're uh, looking for something and, and you want some help, you can ask us any questions and we'll always get back to you uh, trying to help you. Uh, we do have uh, publications. So while I said that Ensemble is free, we really do appreciate it when people uh, cite us in their publications. It helps us know who is using Ensemble and what for. So it always helps us to develop the Ensemble resource for people who are using it in their work. Uh, and then this is the Ensemble team at our latest retreat. So around about 100 people now. Uh, and you can keep up to date with us by following us on Facebook, uh, on Twitter, uh, but also uh, through the blog as well, www.ensemble.info. So in the blog, uh, we have an extended um, article that has information about the data uh, that's been included uh, in the Ensemble and the Ensemble Genome's latest releases as well. So that brings me to the end of the webinar. Uh, I'd just like to finish by thanking uh, everyone in the Ensemble team uh, whose hard work has gone into making the latest Ensemble release possible with all the data that we've just been thinking about. Uh, and obviously all of the funders as well uh, who facilitate the project and help us uh, make the project uh, and the genome browser freely available to you all as well.